when we get a bit older, we tend to, um, you know, get more set in our ways. You know, you've heard the saying that says, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And, and that really comes because, you know, as we age, we start to become more and more set in our ways. And, you know, we, you know, a lot of times it's looking as being stubborn. So Peter, of course, was very stubborn. But for us, um, for us, you know, or for John, uh, shall I say, he, um, he was younger and he was, more, he was more teachable. His heart was more open to the promptings of the Spirit of God. And so with John, he had uh, such a close relationship with Jesus is really was because he had opened his heart to Jesus more. It's not that the other disciples couldn't have had that same, but they hadn't opened it up quite as much. Now, if you look at Peter, um, you know, one of the things that we know about Peter is that he was very boisterous. He was very, you know, um, you know to the point where he's arrogant, right? And, um, you, know, he, you know, he was the one that denied Jesus three times, right? Jesus tried to warn him. So his heart, um, while it was um, open to the promptings of the Spirit, he was also uh, very much set in his ways. So, so with that, um, we have John, who was the, was the last apostle to, you know, uh, to live. In fact, he, he was never crucified. Or he was banished to the island of Patmos. Now, one story that I've heard um, theologians talk about, and I think that and I don't. I know that this is not in the the scriptural writing, but it is from the other other writings in the Bible or um, from biblical scholars that said that there was a time. The reason why John was sent to the island of Patmos. Um, I'm mean, getting a bunch of uh, background, so I'm going to go ahead and mute everyone here. Um, there, it's probably a little bit better. So, um, one of the stories goes is that. Um, they tried to kill John, and um, the emperor at the time had t- uh, had ordered that um, John would be boiled in a vat of boiling oil. And so they got the, the oil uh, boiling, and they lowered him into the vat of oil. But he never died. In fact, when uh, I think they were saying is that when, he, when he, they took him out, he, he basically just had, got a towel and just kind of dried himself off, and that the boiling oil... Um, did not affect him whatsoever. And so because of that, they, they realized that John was protected and they could not kill him. So they wanted to take him away from the influence that he was having upon the people. And so they took him to the island, and so they exiled him to the Isle of Patmos. And there, that was a, a colony of, uh, of, uh, it was a prison colony. And so they, you know, it was basically a hard labor camp. And so that's where, you know, he was disconnected from the church, disconnected from uh, from any influence with the, with um, the people with the growing church, but even there, God was able to use John to give wonderful message to, to us, um, especially about the end times. The book of Revelation was um, written by John, it was the revelation of John of Jesus Christ by John. So, with all of that that I'm saying, the reason why I kind of went into this kind of dialogue about John is to is that of all the disciples, he had the, the closest relationship with Jesus Christ when he was here. I would say that the only other apostle that, uh, and he's really not an apostle because he was with Christ, but he was an apostle because he was, uh, Christ revealed himself to him, and that is Paul. He, re- he uh, revealed himself to Paul on the, on the way to Damascus. And, you know, Paul had a very clear understanding of the gospel and who Jesus Christ was. It's interesting to note, and I guess I'm kind of side, you know, going on a tangent here, but it's interesting to note that Paul, one of the first things that he did was he, when, he, when Christ revealed himself to him, that his, uh, that his sight was brought back to him, is he went and proclaimed Jesus was the Son of God, Jesus as the Son of God. And so John, going back into John, and the whole reason why we're going to talk about this tonight is that John had this very clear understanding of who Christ was. And when you think of the book of John, we think of it as a different gospel from the rest of the, um, you know, from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So I guess they call this, you know, the Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synaptic gospel. 
And the reason why they call it the synaptic gospel is because they are, they are um, focusing on the gospel of Jesus Christ from different angles. So they, they, in, they in essence, say a lot of the same things. Uh, it's just some things are, are duplicated in, in Matthew and Mark uh, and is picked up and that's not, and that's not, and what's not picked up in Matthew and Mark is, is in Luke. And, you know, so they look at it from a different angle. Now, most scholars, when they, when they talk about the book of John, says that John uh, wanted to reveal the divinity of Christ. And while that is absolutely true, there's something a little bit deeper than that, is that John was trying to reveal something more than just Christ was divine. He was revealing why he was divine. So in the prophecies of the Old Testament, it always pointed forward to the Messiah. And the Messiah was always the Son of God. And so when you talk about Christ, Christ is a title that talks about, that, that uh, means Messiah or the Savior, but that the Savior was always the Son of God. Now, when you go to the book of John, chapter 1, we're not, uh, we're not going to jump on there quite yet, but really it's talking about in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was uh, God, and the Word was with God, right? And so uh, those coming from a Trinitarian mindset, a uh, background, um, try to show that, see, Christ is divine. Now, the idea of Christ being divine is that in order for him to be divine, he has to have the attributes of God. He has to be all-knowing, all-present, uh, all-knowing, um, omnipresent, and all-powerful. So all-knowing, all-powerful, and present everywhere. And one of the things is, is that Christ cannot have a beginning. So if he's all-knowing and he's always existed, he has to have always existed. So John comes from, you know, the whole purpose of the book of John is to do one thing. And that is found at the very end of the, of the book of John. Uh, so turn with me, if you will, to John chapter 20. Now, some of you might have headings in, the, in your Bible. And these headings um, sometimes will tell you a little bit about the verses that um, you're reading. And so when I go to my... Uh, I use eSword and I have it on my phone a lot. I like the eSword because it's, you know, it's portable and it's searchable and I can have multiple translations. So, but one of the things, the headings that it has on John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. So those are the two verses we're going to be reading. Um, so for me, the, the title says the purpose of this book. So with that, what I would like to do is um, ask, uh, Marie, if you can go ahead, just unmute yourself and read John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. And the, the Bible that I have, uh, the title there says that you may believe. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God and that believing you may have life in his name. Amen. So what this is telling us is that, you know, a lot of times, you know, we go to the end of the book and we find out the purpose of the book at the end of the book, right? Sometimes they will reveal it in the beginning, but a lot of times you go to the end and, and you know, the whole purpose of why the author is writing something is to convey something important. So obviously John had something very important to reveal. And that is this, is that, you know, he said there's many things, um, there are many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of the, his disciples, which are not written in this book. So he's saying there's a lot of things that were left out of the book. And another verse, if you turn, or you just look right over to John 21, verse um, 25, the very last um, verse in the Bible, or in the, in the book of John, um, it says this, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, to which if they should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. And so what he's saying is, is that there's so much about the um, life of Christ while he was on this earth. And, you know, his mission and his ministry only lasted three and a half years. And so if they had written about everything that he had done, Kind of like how these documentaries, you know, like to do with um, different people in history. 
um, there, there would not be enough books to contain it. But what he's saying is, is that what is contained in the scripture, and especially in the book of John, because he's referring to this book that he's writing, is um, the purpose of it is to reveal something very important. And that is that Jesus is the son of God. And that everything that this book is, the book of John is trying to reveal is that Jesus is the son of God. And when we take a look at that, everything that we read in the book of John has to be interpreted with that in mind. Does that make sense? So why don't we go ahead and turn to the very first chapter of John and let's read how he opens with this in mind. So we're going to go to uh, read John chapter one and I'm going to, um, I don't know, Esther, do you have uh, a Bible that you can read from, um, you know, for us? So go ahead and why don't you read, and I know you've got the NIV, I think, read John 1, 1, uh, actually read John 1, 1 through 3, oh, through 4, 1 through 4. Um, in the, okay, John 1, 1 through 4. Yep. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Oh, very nice. Thank you for, for reading that. Now, one thing that we, when we read this, we, we seem to, um, we got to, you know, we, we, what I was saying earlier is that we have to interpret it based upon the whole purpose of what John was trying to reveal. He was trying to reveal that Jesus was the Son of God. Not just that he was divine, but that his divinity came through the fact that he was the Son of God. So when you, when you have that in mind, the mindset that you have there is you reading, um, you read John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. So who is the Word? Mike, what do you think? Who is the word? Marie said it. Jesus. I didn't hear it. So what is it, Marie? Jesus. Jesus, absolutely, right? So when, whenever you talk, when it talks about the word, and you notice it is capitalized, I think in most versions you're going to see it capitalized. So in the beginning was the word. Then it says, and the word, Jesus, was with whom? God. God. Okay. And then it says, and the word was God. And so a lot of times, well, all the time, those that with a Trinitarian mindset that are looking at this is that they're trying to prove that, that Christ is divine and that, he's, and that he's divine because he is God. Now, when we look at the verses in the end of the book, which is talking about the whole purpose of the book, is that the purpose of this book is to prove that Christ is divine but the reason why he's divine is because he is the son of God. And so uh, I think there were some translations or when you, when you look at the actual words that they use to say the word and such and God, is that it's really saying God as in divine. So we as humans are human, right? We're human because we are born from humans. Very simple thing, right? And, you know, we have dogs, and I have a, a dog that's pregnant, and she's going to give birth. What do you think that she's going to give birth to? Piglets. Yeah. Dogs, right? <laughs> I, I heard, I saw uh, Esther's voice uh, or, or mouth moving, and I'm pretty sure she said dogs. So absolutely, <laughs> we know Puppy. that she is going to have dogs, right? Little puppies, right? <laughs> The reason why she's going to have puppies is because she is a dog, right? Mm -hmm. um, no matter how much in evolution they try to say is that, you know, we came from whatever, you know, uh, they never can show a transition between one species and the next. The Bible says is that everything is to produce after its own kind. And so in like manner, God pr produced after his own kind. And so when it's talking about God here, it's talking about his divinity. And so in the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and the word was divine. 
and Jesus was divine. Why was Jesus divine? He is divine because he came forth from the Father. So remember, the whole purpose of the book of John is to reveal that Jesus is the Son of God. So where in the record of the Bible do we find the birth of Jesus Christ? Not, not, you know, not um, with Mary, but where do we have the beginning of Christ? Where do you think, Mike? Okay, you're going to have to, you're going to have to, you can keep yourself on mute, but it, where do you think, Mike, where, where, where in the Bible do we find that? John 1. John 1, 1? Okay, yeah. that's true. You're right, but there's another place, and it's in the Old Testament, so why don't we go ahead and turn there? Proverbs chapter 8. So who wrote the book of Proverbs, Esther? Do you know who wrote um, Proverbs? John. Okay, no, not quite. <laughs> John wasn't even born yet. So, um, oh, yeah. David? David's son, King Solomon. Solomon, King Solomon, the wisest man that ever uh, was on this earth, uh, of course, other than Christ, um, wrote the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. So he wrote two books. I think also the Song of Solomon. So three books. All right, so we're going to go to Proverbs chapter 8. Um, and we're going to read verses 20, um, Proverbs chapter 8, 22 through 25. And I'm going to, Joseph, are you there? Can you read that for us? Uh, mm -hmm. verse, Proverbs 8. Mm -hmm. 22 through 25. 22 to 25. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. Okay. Well, as yet, oh, 25? Yeah, go ahead and go to all the way to verse 30. Oh, just go to verse 30? Yeah, go all the way to 30. Then I was by him, as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. Okay. So, with that, we're talking, you know, this, this chapter is talking about wisdom, right? But we know that this is, is talking about Jesus Christ in the beginning. So, in, the, in verse 22, it says, the Lord. Who is the Lord that he's talking about? It, the it's Father. Talking about the Father. It's talking about um, you know, God himself. So it says, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way. Now, I'm going to take, you know, I want to, I've never done this. I want to take a look at what does the New Living Translation say about this. So Proverbs, let's see, where's Proverbs? Chapter 8. Verses 22. Oh, here's you know, it says the Lord formed me from the beginning before he created anything else. I was appointed in ages past at the very first before the earth began. So when we look at it, we have the Lord possessed me or formed me, or um, and I think a more accurate um, translation is that he he um, acquired me. So as a parent. We have children. How do we acquire our children? Do we create our children? That's a good question, right? So, do we create mm -hmm. our children? What do you think? Okay. Um, let me ask um, Darlene. Hi, Darlene. Good to see you tonight. Can you unmute yourself? Answer me this question. Do we create our children? Do what? Do we create our children? Ooh, what? Oh. <laughs> I didn't hear the question. Okay, can you? Okay. Do we create our children? Yes. Okay, so you say yes. Okay. What do you think, Esther? 
Well, through husband and wife, a child is created. Okay, a child is born, right? Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you this. How many created beings are there or have, have there have, have been? Now think of, uh, Adam. okay, you have Adam, right? How was Adam, you know, how was, how did Adam come into to existence? He was created by God. Okay, he was created. So God formed him out of the dust of the earth, right? Breathed him in the breath of life and he became a living soul, right? So how is it, how is it what, that we create? I would say that we don't create, we give birth to it. So that the process of creation is really from God. Um, you know, life, life. The creation begins in the womb through. Right. But the creation of Adam and, and how we came to life are uh, different, right? Adam was created. We were born. Okay. So there's a difference between created and a difference between born. And so what I'm trying to say is in Proverbs chapter 8, what happened there was that Christ, the Son of God, came from the Father. How do we know this? Well, we know that this was before anything was. So there was actually, there was nothing that was. There, in the beginning with, with the Father, there was just the Father. And then through some means... God doesn't really reveal that to us. He acquired his son from himself. How do we know this is true? Go to the book of Genesis. Okay, go to the book of Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Darlene, why don't you read 1, verse 26? Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Okay. So what God did was, he said to one or more people, persons, beings, he said, let us make man in our image. Okay. So... How is it that God, um, how is it that we can understand how, uh, how Christ was begotten of the Father? Is through the creation of man. Because he said, let us make man in our image. And so we, as human beings, have to be in the image of God. So not just, um, not just um, spiritually, but also relationally. So... If you look at the very next text, why don't um, Darlene read the la verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Okay. So when he created man in the image of God, he created man and woman. So the image of God is how many beings? One or two or three? Two. Two, right? Not three. And so what I'm trying to say here is that God created man as an illustration to the angels and the rest of the world how the Son of God was brought forth from himself. Because we have Adam, and, I, and I, I'm trying to remember if I have the text here. Um, Adam, it says, was, um, was created... He was formed out of the dust, dust of the earth, right? So God created him out of the dust of the earth, and he breathed in him the breath of life, and he became a living soul. So Adam was formed by God. Now, how was Eve created? And from, Adam's rib. from Adam's rib. From Adam's rib. Absolutely right. So... Um, Let's see. Let me see if I can find the text real quick. There. And, and let's go to verse 21. So, um, Mike, Mike, why don't you go ahead and read um, uh, Genesis 2, 21 through 23. 
Genesis 2? Yes. Yeah. 2, 21 through 23. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Okay. So, so here we have Adam was created in one way and Eve was created in a separate way. Now, if you notice here in, um, in uh, verse 21, this was the very first surgery here on this earth. You notice that? So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept. That's just like someone being put in an anesthesia. And he took one of his ribs and closed the flesh inside thereof. So he opened him up, took out a, a, a bone, and then he closed him up. So that was the very first surgery here on this earth performed by God himself. Okay. Now, actually it's by the son of God. But God did it through him. So anyway, um, so Eve was created in a different manner. So you notice here is that she was taken, like my wife had said, from the very rib of Adam, from the very bosom, from the very side. Now, if you take that and you go right back over to Proverbs chapter 8, right? And, and you read it in that context. Okay, we got some dogs. <laughs> All right. So it says here, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting from the beginning of ever the earth was. So this happened before anything was. And so he was brought forth from the father, right? In the same way, Eve was brought forth from Adam. Adam and Eve are a representation of the father and the son. Adam was to represent the father and Eve was to represent the son. Eve was brought forth from the Father, even as Jesus, the Son of God, was brought forth from the Father. And so the, the whole reason why God created man was to, re to, was to represent to the angels um, how Jesus is the Son of God. So what was the one contention that Satan had up in heaven? Did, the, did, did Satan have a contention with the Father, or did he have a contention with the Son of God? What do you think? Who did, who did Satan have a, a bone to pick with? Son. The Son of God, right? It's always been with the Son of God. And how, do, how, do, how did the angels know that Jesus was the Son of God? Well, the only way for him to know, for them to know, was, was it was told to them by the Son, by the Father. Because the Son is the Word of God. He is the mouthpiece of God. He is the one that speaks for the Father. My niece got home, so that's why they're barking. And, it's, and it would do me no good to tell them to be quiet. So anyway, so so here's here's the um, here's the crux of it is that Proverbs is talking about when the Son was brought forth from the Father. Now, the book of John is trying to reveal that Jesus is the Son of God. He is divine because he came forth from the Father. All right, now how do we know, how can we prove from the Bible that the, what we read in Proverbs is talking about Jesus and it's not just talking about wisdom? Well, it's pretty simple. Is, is one, is one you, can, you can just use your... Use your, your um, reasoning powers to understand this one thing. Is that, if was there ever a time when, when the father was not um, wise? Is intellectual wisdom something that God somehow eventually came into? What do you think? No. No. He's always been wise, right? 
So it can't be talking about intellectual wisdom. It has to be talking about wisdom under the guise of something else. So turn to the book of 1 Corinthians. So 1 Corinthians um, chapter 1 and verse 24. Um, why don't we, I'll go ahead and read that. So 1 Corinthians 1 verse 24 says this. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greek, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. And so what we find here is that in the book of Corinthians, Paul is telling them is that Jesus Christ is the power of God and he is the wisdom of God. Then in verse 30, it says, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who is of God, notice of God, meaning he came forth from God, is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and, re and redemption. And so the wisdom that he's talking about here in Proverbs is the fact that Jesus is the wisdom of God. He was made wisdom for us so that we can, uh, so that we can understand who Christ is or who the Father is. And so when you, when you put him in this context, John is trying to tell all those who are reading his book, all those that this was going to the to the um, to the the early church, he was trying to show them and to reveal to them that Jesus was the Son of God. Very simply put, because we know that the purposes of that. Now, with that, let's take a look a little further in the book of John, chapter uh, one, and let's go to verse fourteen. Okay, um, Esther, why don't you read? Um, John 1 14. So you're muted, so you'll probably have to unmute yourself once you get there. The word became flesh, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. All right. Thanks, honey. So really what this is saying here is that he's trying to reveal Jesus is the son of God. And it says, and the word, Jesus, was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as of the glory of the only begotten of the Father. So what do you think the word begotten means? When you, when you look at the, in, in the King James, it says begotten. Um, other ones I, I might say something a little bit different. I think what uh, Esther wrote or read um, said he, you know, was the only son of the Father. So what do you think begotten means? Begotten means born, simply put. He is the only born of the Father. And so there's a difference between someone that was created and, there's a, and someone that was begotten. And so John is trying to tell us that Jesus is the Son of God. And so you read all the way through his, his, the, the word, in his, his, the book of John, is that he is testifying that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, one other place that um, John um, reveals this very clearly is in the book of 1 John. So why don't we go ahead and turn to the book of 1 John. And let's go to verse um, chapter 5. So we're going to have, um, Marie, can you read when you get there? So 1 John, trouble finding it myself. 1 John chapter 5, and let's read verse 11 and 12. Uh, actually, hold on a second. Um, that's 1 Peter. 5, verse, yeah, verse 11 and 12. Okay. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. He who has the son has life, but he who does not have the son of God does not have life. 
so why is it why is it that um, we need to have the Son of God to have life to have life right so the life that we have is not everlasting life the life that we have is finite it is uh, it's it's uh, mortal it 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 has an end and it's really not life at all it's a temporary life and so our problem is that we need a new life a life that we cannot have now is it, do we know of anyone that has never died by themselves who has was born and live and continues to live today here on this earth no no the one thing that is assured is that we will die right the reason why we will die is because we have a life that cannot be sustained right the life that we have will end what god desired to give us was his life and he gives it to us through his son and that's why it says in first john 5 11 it says um and this is the record that god hath given us eternal life life without end and that life is in his son how is it that the son has life in himself where did the son get his life well, we see the father. Father. Yeah, through the Father. But where can we see that in the Bible? We simply go to the book of John, chapter five. Notice, remember, what was the what was the whole reason why he was um, he wrote the book of John was to reveal that Jesus was the Son of God. And so, when we go to John five verse twenty six, Darlene, why don't you read that for us? John five twenty six. John 5, 26, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. Absolutely. So the whole point is, is that for as the Father has life in himself. So the Father is the, the source, the originator of all life, right? All life is sustained by the Father because it comes from the Father. But the Father, it says, for as the Father has life in himself, so has he given the son to have life in himself. How did he give his son to have life in himself? He gave it to him because it was inherited. When he came forth from the father, he took with him, he gave to him his own very own life, his divine life, his everlasting life. The son of God does not, does not, um, is not sustained by the Father. The Son of God is sustained because he has the inherent life of God himself. Not because he is divine, but because he is the Son of God. The Son of God has everlasting life, not because he's, the, uh, not because he's divine of himself, it's because he is, he is um, divine because he got that from the Father. And this verse right here, for as the Father has life in himself, so has he given to the Son to have life in himself, is talking about how Christ received his life. And so that, that goes hand in hand with the verse in 1 John 5, verse 11, which says, and this is the record that God hath given us eternal life, and that life is in his Son. John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave, his only begotten son. Why did he give his only begotten son? Why didn't he just say, you know, why didn't he just give it to us directly? It's because he needed to give it through his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We receive everlasting life through his, or through the son. Why through the son? Go back to John 1, verse uh, 14. John 1, 14 says, And the Word, Jesus, the Son of God, was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, God could not give us his life directly. Why couldn't he? He needed because God is divine and we are human right? 
he is he is a different order of being just as we are a different order of being right so what god did was he put he joined divinity with humanity he joined divinity with humanity and through that union he then now is able to give his life to us because his son became a man and became flesh and that is how we receive the life of god god is a spirit and the bible says is that we should worship him in spirit and in truth right and the father seeketh those to work uh, to worship him right i think that comes from the book of mark uh, when he's uh, when he's talking to the the woman at the well but the whole point is this is that um in order for us to receive the the life of god it had to be received in humanity and that is how christ brings and unites us together so we receive the very life of god through the son so when we accept christ as our savior we are born again and we receive the life of god through christ living within us the beautiful thing is and we're coming to the end of our study is this is that the book of john when we understand what it is trying to share with us is trying to share with us the very the fact is that jesus is the son of god the bad thing is is that um there's a deception out there that is trying to deceive us into receiving a false Christ. You remember we talked a few weeks back when we were talking about Matthew chapter 24. The very first thing that Jesus said when he was warning his disciples about the deceptions of the last days, right? He said, take heed that no man deceives you. Take heed that no man deceives you. For many shall come in my name, right? Talking about false Christ, and so the false Christ that is that is already here is the name of the false Christ is God the Son, who is God first and Son second. He is divine because he has always been divine. That is the counterfeit. He is the Son is only a metaphor. Now think about this. The Bible says is that our everlasting life comes from the fact. That Jesus is the Son of God. If we accept a false God, a false Christ called God the Son, we are not receiving the life of the Father because we are not receiving the life of the Father through the Son. If God the Son has always existed and is not really the Son of God, then we are not receiving the Father's life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only born son his it has to be the the son of god because he declares that this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased on the mount of transfiguration he says this is my beloved son hear ye him and so this whole the book of john reveals that jesus is the son of god it's not a metaphor it's not um it's not just a illustration. If, if we receive a, a, a Christ that is not really the Son of God, we are receiving a salvation that is not real as well. If we want to have a real salvation, we must have the real Son of God. Because through the Son, we receive the life of the Father. And that's really what, what the study is about tonight. The very fact that the book of John the purpose of the book of John is to reveal that Jesus is the Son of God. Amen. Amen. Right. Any any um, any last um, thoughts or any, any questions or you know comments that you'd like to make about what we studied here tonight? Okay. Well, I know we. Go ahead, Mike. No, I know we I know we've studied this before, but I like how we revisit it and you know try to drill it into my head because it takes a few times for me to <laughs> I'll be honest. I mean, you know, doing the whole Yeah, so it works out when we do this study again and again and again. Yeah, and I and I know it's a bit of repetition, but 
you know, sometimes you nope. really do need this repetition because if you did it, I wouldn't remember. So you got to, what do you call it? Re, uh, you know, keep on uh, <laughs> pounding yep. it in my head. <laughs> but, you know, also you're going to run into people that are going to tell you something different. And in, unless we're grounded in what we believe, um, you know, it's going to be easy to get frustrated and flustered and confused. And, you know, they seem to know what they're talking about. Because really, when you, when you think about, um, you know, when you're talking with pastors and elders and theologians, I mean, you know, they, they've studied this for a long time. And, you know, it can be intimidating. Right, Mike? What do you think? Yeah, I never, I never mention stuff about the Bible to anybody unless I'm definitely sure I can back it up or, or, or go to passages or scripture and stuff like that and, and actually uh, support my beliefs. Absolutely. So I kind of, I kind of, you know, I don't go out there and say, you know, Jesus, is just, you know, I mean, you know, you know what I mean? Unless I, I get more clear with the material, then I can kind of, you know, stand my ground and, and present, you know, right, Esther? <laughs> I know. I could be like that too. Uh, I still don't share it as often or as much as I, I wish I can because, you know, that's what we're here for is to share the, the gospel to everybody so that Jesus Christ can come. Um, but it was just, uh, in fact, just recently, it's, it's funny how you just said that because uh, I heard it in the, and I, I only listened to Joy 92. And they did say that, that um, I think they're talking about evangelism. But they said that, um, you know, don't worry that you don't know the passages. Just go and just just share what you heard or whatever, because that's planting the seed. That's going to, you know, might trigger it. Oh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read some more about that, you know. And just be, be truthful. Just saying, I, I, sorry, I don't even know exactly where it is. But, you know, that's, it, it is in the Bible. Um, but yeah, I used to be like that. I used to like, nope, I'm not saying anything at all until <laughs> I know. So, yeah. But, right. Um, yeah. You know, but the, you know, the simple stuff like, like my cousins who all go to mass and, you know, do all the, uh, sign of the cross and all that stuff. And, you know, I kind of throw out there every once in a while that stuff that has been drilled in my head that I'm confident in repeating or sharing, I'll say it like from, you know, repetitious praying and all this stuff, you know, I, I, I mentioned stuff like that, you know, kneeling down and, you know, to a, to a statue and praising saints, you know, worshiping saints and stuff like that. So I, I share those kind of things. So. Sure. You know, share whatever the Lord puts on your heart. But what I like what Marie was saying is share what you know, because when you share it, it becomes more solid in your mind. And yeah. it's like, I can only do what I'm doing here is because I've shared it. I, you know, I, I don't, you know, I, in my mind, a lot of times I get confused when it, or as far as not confused necessarily, but you know, where this text is or where that text is. But I find that the more I use a text, the more solid it is in my mind. Like um, you know, First John um, 5.11. I mean, I, I know it because I use it a lot. But, you know, here's one that I, uh, I thought was really interesting. We, a lot of times we'll use this verse text called uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 6. And the King James has it a certain way. And it makes sense. But when I read it in the New Living Translation, let's go ahead and turn there. So first, um, uh, 1 Corinthians um, 8, 6. Eight six. Yep. So, um, Marie, why don't you go mm -hmm. ahead and read it from one of your translations? What translation? Yeah, for, oh, what translation yeah, are you yeah. using? I'm using the the should be the New King James Version. Okay, go ahead and read that. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for Him and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we live. Okay, good. 
Um, Esther, you have the um, the NIV, right? Yes. Go ahead and read that one. Yes. Yet for us, there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. Wow, that is really nice and clear. That one is... is um, about as good as the one I'm, I'm going to read here, the New Living Translation. But for us, mm -hmm. there is one God, the Father. So it's very clear. There is one God, the Father, by whom all things were created and for whom we live. And there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things were created and through whom we live. So uh, the NIV and the N uh, NLT very good. I, I think the New King James was also a pretty good one. But what it's telling us is very clearly is that there is a distinction between the Father and the Son. And that the Father is the one true God. And Jesus is, um, you know, and we live through Jesus. So the Father created all things and we live for him. And all things were created by the Son. And it's through whom we live. So really you know, pretty beautiful. So just use what you have. I mean, if you know John 3.16, use John 3.16, because it's not about doctrine, Mike. It's not. Okay, doctrine, what doctrine does is it leads us into a clearer and a closer relationship with Jesus Christ. But just knowing the doctrine does not save us. It's that it's Jesus Christ who saves us. The doctrine helps us to grow closer to Christ. And so there's a difference there. There's a lot of people out there that know doctrine. In fact, I was one of those who was, you know, I was big time doctor. And I knew the prophecies and I knew all these things and I sounded like I knew what I was talking about. But unless we know Jesus Christ, we don't know anything because prophecy cannot save us. So, Anyway, and share with that's you. like what you said there too is is once we have this personal relationship with Jesus Christ, he's gonna reveal to us how to say it or what mm -hmm. to say. Yeah. yeah. But that's what we that's what in fact you know that's that's my main is like you know I, I always ask Jesus to be in, in my heart today to mm -hmm. to be in my life today to show me Show me his will, you know, because um, there's no, I can say it, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. But um, totally different topic because um, uh, we brought this up and I didn't know how to explain it to him. Remember that question about the, the baby, about being a, a sin? Um, how uh, we were, we were born sinners. Right. And what was your question? I was like, how can the baby be a sinner if it was not even born? It was just born. It didn't have a chance to sin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I and I said we're 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 we have a sinful nature. Yep. But You're telling me the baby was sinning in the in the womb. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, look that that's that's a very valid point, and it really comes down to what is sin. Now, if you, if you take a very narrow look at it, the way a lot of um, some people do, and especially the Seventh-day Adventists, they, they take it a very narrow view that sin is the transgression of the law. And it's absolutely true that sin is the transgression of the law, but there's, sin is more than just the transgression of the law. Sin is, what Marie was saying, is our nature. We sin, we commit acts of sin because our nature is sinful. My dog, Raider, you know, it doesn't matter if I tell him to stop barking, he's going to bark, right? Because it's in his nature to do so. It's not wrong for him to bark because he's a dog. That's what he does, right? Um, and it doesn't matter how well you train a dog. Um, did you see that video? I don't know if we sent it out to everybody, but did you see the video of the two dogs that when um, they, the, the owner fed the dogs the food, and he actually had them bow their heads and they put their paws up on the, on the bucket 
and they and and he prayed and so he said bow your heads while i pray and he did this all in spanish and then when they were done praying he told them go ahead you can eat so he said amen and, and whatever he said and then they went and ate their food now they trained the dogs to pray but were they praying no they weren't praying they were just you know they were mimicking prayer right but in their heart they're still dogs right so they may have an out outward form of something that seems to be um righteousness but in reality the problem is within our heart what did what did uh, jeremiah 17 verse 9 says i know my wife was uh, esther was saying that that was a text that she really liked is that the heart is deceitful above all things desperately wicked who can know it and so we sin not be, you know, it, the problem was is not our actions because you remember the story of the Jews, right? They were so exacting in their outward demeanor. What Christ was telling them is that they have whitewashed sepulchers, meaning that they had a, um, an outward form that looked really beautiful and holy and righteous, but inside they were not righteous. And so um, the law can only take care of your uh, actions, right? And even then, but in our hearts, we want to do sinful things, right? It's in our nature to do these sinful things. Yeah, yeah, but that's us as adults. I think the question has to do with the baby. You know, the the baby's innocent. The baby does not know how to talk, doesn't know how to swallow food, chew food. Well, you know, you know what I'm, you know what I mean. And, and you're right. A baby is innocent. They have not committed any acts of sin. But do they need, let me just ask you this question, do they need Jesus Christ in order to be saved? Yes. Why? You're right, but why? I guess because of our sinful nature. I don't know. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. Is that um, what needs to change in all of us is that we need to receive a new nature, a new life. That's why um, Jesus said that we must be born again. John 3, the whole thing with Jesus, okay. with Nicodemus, we must be born again. And so okay. while a baby is not committing acts of sin, a baby has a sinful nature that will okay. manifest itself at some point in sinful acts outside of the power of God. So because you, you ask yourself, Jesus was born of a woman, right? He became flesh, and he was a baby, uh, and and he he grew up. Um, but if Christ can do that, if he could be born of a woman, and then he could somehow not sin, couldn't a human do that? And the answer Christ is, is different. You can't compare it, right? Correct. Why? What was different about Christ? versus say a baby that is born you know any baby that is born he had something that a a human baby does not have he was conceived without original sin he had yes i i'm i'm, I'm agreeing with you what i'm saying is is that he had the the, the divine nature of god he had the perfect okay. nature of god together with humanity so that's what he had that was different and so that's why a baby still needs salvation. Okay. Because we need a new <laughs> So anyway, does that answer your question, Mike? Because a baby is innocent, right? Absolutely innocent, but still needs a new life. And that life is received in the same way. Yeah. Okay. So okay. a baby, like with human, sin with human nature, sinful nature. Okay. Yep. Okay. Any any other any other thoughts or so before we close? Questions or something? Okay, good. Well, thanks for that. Um, I, I really appreciate you all joining us tonight. This is the first time I decided to do it outside. I, it was really kind of nice, even though we had some of the dog or the dogs barking. But um, you know, maybe we'll do it again. God blessed us with a good weather, um, no rain, so. Praise God for that. Maybe next time we'll be outside. 
Yeah, hey, <laughs> go for it. Yeah, yeah. You have a yeah. Very, you have a nice patio there in the back. Yeah, you have a nice patio. You have uh, really good landscaping. Uh, you have lots and lots of trees and stuff. So. Too much, dude. Too much maintenance. Yeah, yards are maintenance. That's for sure. Okay. Why don't we um, Why don't we close with prayer? Bow our heads. Our kind and loving Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the blessing you've revealed to us here in your word. We, we thank you for your son. We love you. We love Jesus. We thank you for the work that he's doing in our hearts. Father, we just like to, um, to give honor and glory to your name here tonight. I pray that you will you know, be with all of our prayer requests that we've talked about. I pray that, um, Lord, if, you know, please guide our, our hearts and our minds when it comes to deciding on a, a place of worship. We know that it's a, it'll be a commitment. We, we don't know the future. We don't know um, all the things that you have planned for us, Father, but we know that you want us to meet together. And so, Father, if, if, if we just pray that your spirit will, will be upon all of us as we um, decide on a place to worship, Father, you know, we're, we're just, we are happy that we can meet online, but Lord, we know we need to be together. And because of the times that we're living in, things are kind of unsure. And so we just ask that you guide our hearts and minds and not just to guide us to the place, but to give us clear evidence that this is what you want us to do. Provide the funds that, you, that we need to do it. Uh, open the hearts of, of all of those involved as we make these decisions uh, that will impact all of our lives, Father. But we really desire that all of this will be to your honor and glory, that we can uh, use it in a way that will bless others and further the work and to hasten your second coming. So I ask your, your continued presence to be with all of us here today and all of our members that we can um, finish the work, Father, that you have given us to do. I ask all of this in the blessed and powerful and wonderful name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us and uh, have a, a good rest of the evening and the rest of your, your week. Um, we will be meeting online this coming Sabbath. Uh, so uh, just um, uh, join, us, uh, join us again this Sabbath. So good night and uh, sleep tight. God bless you all. Hey, the, the, so do you want to share, Esther, you want to share your feelings about what you saw today? Oh, I'm sorry. I was not. I was not oh. there. Oh, I thought you joined him. It was just me and Wes. Yeah, just the two of yeah. us. Then... Sorry. I, um, yeah, uh, I had to come home. My mom needed something. She, I need to help her with something. Yep. Well, we uh, we looked at the one up uh, above Hornet, and I like that that space. <laughs>